Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our labs playlist. In previous videos, we talked about serum uric acid, serum proteins such as albumin and globulin. We talked about serum protein electrophoresis, serum potassium, serum chloride. We talked about acetylcholine esterase enzyme, the true one and the pseudo one. We also talked about lactic acid and lactate dehydrogenase. Today, it's another serum test, which is the prostate-specific antigen. It's a generator of antibodies and it's specific to the tissue of your prostate gland. Is the PSA test useful? Let's find out. Please watch the videos in this playlist in order. Prostate-specific antigen. Break that down for me. It's an antigen that is specific to the prostate gland. What's an antigen? It's a protein that generates antibodies against it. This is what an antigen is. So just think of it as a small piece of protein specific to the prostate gland. Which means if I see this in your blood, where do you think it's coming from? From your prostate gland. But let's say that I do not have a prostate gland. Then what? Then the PSA level in your blood should be zero or almost zero zero. Who makes it? The prostate gland. Does it serve a function? Yes, it probably inhibits the sperm motility inhibitor. When you inhibit the inhibitor of the sperm motility, the sperm will swim and dive and move, increasing your chance of fertility and lowering your chance of infertility. This is the physiological function of the PSA. But what's the clinical significance or the lab significance for the PSA? It can help us diagnose prostate cancer. And it can help us follow up with the patients already confirmed to have prostate cancer. It can help us guide the treatment. It can help us predict the course of the cancer. If it's getting higher and higher and higher, that's bad news. If it's getting lower and lower and lower, that's good news. It can also help you follow up what's going on after prostate surgery. After your prostate has been removed, PSA is expected to decrease, 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 decrease until it becomes almost zero. But what if it's not decreasing? What if it decreased in the beginning and then came back up again? Well, this could be cancer recurrence or it could be that the surgeon did not do a good job removing all of the prostate tissue. So what's up with prostate cancer and the PSA? If I have prostate cancer, cancers, as you know, do not obey rules. So they keep invading and invading and invading, disrupting membranes, breaching barriers. And before you know it, the PSA, instead of just living in the prostate gland, is living now all over my body, including my bloodstream. So now if I take a sample from your vein, I'll find tons of PSA. What is cancer? Cancer is growth, but this is not the normal growth that you see in an embryo. And it's not the growth of tissue after injury in order to heal and repair and regenerate. This growth can be fatal. It's an abnormal growth. So where should we put cancer here? Cancer is a neoplasia, new growth. This new growth could be benign, no big deal, or malignant, big freaking deal. Most of the time you can guess whether it's benign or malignant based on the lingo that doctors use to communicate with one another. For example, adenoma is benign, but adenocarcinoma is malignant. When you see the word carcinoma or sarcoma, it means malignant, which means cancer. But benign is not malignant. Benign is not cancer. Definition of neoplasia or new growth. It's an abnormal mass of tissue. Neoplasia by definition is a mass. Cancer is a mass. A benign tumor is also a mass. Is this normal? No, it's not. This growth is abnormal. Why? It exceeds the normal tissue. It's uncoordinated with the rest of the body. It persists even after cessation of the stimulus that caused the growth in the first place. Unlike tissue regeneration or repair after injury. Because after injury, my tissue repairs and then we stop. We do not persist normally. We do not hang around for a long time normally. When the stimulus is gone, we're gone. The growth should stop, not in neoplasias. So the word tumor is almost synonymous with the word neoplasia, which means anything that ends in oma except Oklahoma. Adenoma is a tumor. Adenocarcinoma is a tumor. Papilloma, tumor. Papillary carcinoma, tumor. Ganglioneuroma, ganglioblastoma, 
just neuroma, neurofibroma, lipoma, you name it, these are tumors. They could be benign, no big deal, or malignant, big deal. The malignant ones can be divided into carcinoma if they originate from your epithelial tissue, or we can call them sarcoma, sarco means flesh, if they originate from your flesh, your connective tissue. Basically, anything that's not an epithelium. Next, cancer predilection preferences. When cancer metastasizes, by the way, benign tumors never metastasize, it can select the tissue to which it will metastasize. For example, carcinomas prefer to metastasize to lymph, but sarcomas prefer to metastasize to blood. It's flesh and blood. Most prostate cancers are here. They are adenocarcinomas, and carcinomas metastasize to lymph nodes. Quiz time. If I have prostate carcinoma, which lymph node will be involved? In other words, which lymph node will my prostate cancer metastasize to? Let me know the name of the group of lymph nodes in the comment section. Cancer is a growth with no control, growth with no limit, growth with no evident cause. We know many risk factors, but cause let's be humble. Correlation is not the same as causation. The only exception is if you said that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. I'm not gonna yell at you. But with anything else, please say it's a risk factor. It's associated with cancer, not necessarily causes cancer. Cancers serve no useful function and they can arise from any type of cells in your body. Some of them do not secrete anything, others secrete something. These are called perineoplastic syndromes. And if you have watched my video titled Oncology Basics, we have compared between benign and malignant tumors before. You will find that video in my pathology playlist. Look at this invasion. Do you think this will respect your prostate gland barriers? No. It will erode and erode and erode, enlarge and invade until pew, it metastasizes. If it's carcinoma, it goes to lymph, lymph vessels, then lymph nodes. How does cancer kill people? Many mechanisms. Please pause and review. Prostate cancer can metastasize to the spine, the bones or the vertebrae in my back. True story, Charlie Munger, the vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, worth about a gazillion dollars, is 99 years old and he never ever let any freaking doctor measure his serum PSA. He does not want to know his serum PSA level. Why? First, the PSA is not the most specific test. If the test has low specificity, the false positive rate is high. What's a false positive? It's a test that comes back positive, i.e. meaning that I have cancer. However, I am normal. I do not have cancer. It's a false positive test. According to Mosby's, 80% of PSA screening tests are false positives. These patients will be scared out of their wits thinking that they have prostate cancer, but it's false in many cases. Moreover, even if they do have prostate cancer, the mortality does not decrease significantly by measuring the PSA. Why not? Because prostate cancer is a very slowly progressive cancer. Most patients who die at old age die from something else other than their prostate. They die from a heart disease, for example, from femur fracture, etc. Can we offer some counter argument against Charlie? Yes, if the PSA is so high, I mean greater than 20, and there is positive digital rectal exam, both of them are cheap, by the way, they tell us that cancer in the prostate is likely. Moreover, it's not just about measuring the PSA once, it's about the rate, the trending of the level. Is the level increasing over time? Is the level decreasing over time? If it's increasing, how fast is the increase? If it is so fast, i.e. the velocity is greater than 0.35 nanogram per ml per year, then it's probably cancer that is fast growing. In other words, the PSA is not entirely useful. It's not entirely useless either. It depends on the case. For screening, it's not the best test. It's not like the pap smear for cervical cancer. They are not even close. Translation, if I have no idea whether or not I have prostate cancer, the PSA is not the most helpful of tests. However, if I already do have prostate cancer, then measuring my PSA over time is a wonderful tool to tell me what's happening to my cancer. Is it regressing? Is it growing? Is it metastasizing? Is it getting worse? Am I responding to the treatment? Am I responding to the prostatectomy or the surgical remover of the prostate? 
Did the surgeon do a good job removing all of the cancer cells or did the surgeon leave some malignant tissue behind? As Dr. Thomas Soul says, there are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. Deciding whether or not to get a PSA should be an individual decision. Personally, will I do it right now? No. But let's say my father has prostate cancer. Will I do it? Yes. Because now I know that I'm high risk. If I already do have prostate cancer, will I order PSA tests many times to see what's happening to my cancer? Also, yes. Sensitivity versus specificity. Remember, true is on top and then divide by everything. Here is sensitivity. True is on top. Put the true positive here. Put everything, I mean true positive plus false negative, down here. Let's say that this is 80 and this is 20. What's the total? It's 100. 80 over the total, which is 100, equals a sensitivity of 80%. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen if this 80 went up to 90. When the true positives go up, therefore the 20 has to go down to 10 so that the total is 100. Which means, as my sensitivity goes up, false negatives have to go down. Conversely, if sensitivity goes down, false negatives will go up. With specificity, it deals with the false positives. High specificity means low false positive. Low specificity means high false positive. The PSA test is here. It is not very specific for prostate cancer, which means many positive test results are false, i.e. there is no prostate cancer. PSA is especially not specific in the gray zone between 4 and 10 nanograms per ml. Greater than 20, PSA becomes a good test. It's the dose that makes the poison. It's the level that makes the significance. Plus your history, your physical exam, your family history, your pre-test probability, i.e. the chance that you do have prostate cancer before we even order the PSA test. All of these factors play a role. That's why you need a good doctor, not a doofus with a stethoscope. Can we increase the accuracy of the prostate-specific antigen? Yes, by adjusting it to age, because old people on average have higher PSA than young people. By adjusting it to the volume of the prostate tissue, by adjusting it to the dense by distinguishing between free PSA and PSA that is bound to proteins or by changing the cutoff value. Of course, you know that if you lower the cutoff value, sensitivity goes up and false negatives go down. Other than this PSA, do we have other options? We have many options, including prostate acid phosphatase, or PAP, prostate-specific proteins, including the PSA that we're talking about today, and early prostate cancer antigen, which we'll talk about in the next video. Plus, we have more modern prostate cancer-specific genetic markers like all of these. Hey PSA, tell us about yourself. Well, normally I should be less than 2.6 nanogram per ml. Again, don't forget it's related to age. Old people tend to have higher PSA. Why do you use me? We can use that test to diagnose prostate cancer or better to follow up with the patient with a confirmed prostate cancer to see whether or not they are responding to the treatment or whether or not there is a recurrence of cancer. The sample is taken from your vein, not from your urine. The tube is the red top tube. Translation, it does not have an anticoagulant, which means the blood will clot down here, serum will separate up here, take that serum, send it to the lab, find the PSA in the serum and measure it. How do I measure it? Using one of these techniques, electrohemiluminescence or immunohistochemistry or radioimmunoassay. Then let's measure your serum PSA. If it's lower than 2.6, normal. Between 2.6 and 10 nanograms per ml is slightly elevated. Some textbooks will call it slightly to moderately elevated. 10 to 19.9, moderately elevated. All of this is still gray zone. PSA becometh more accurate above 20 nanograms per ml. And we call this significantly elevated serum PSA. Causes of elevation. Of course, we're doing Doing this to diagnose prostate cancer. But remember, there are false positives. Old age could raise PSA. Digital rectal exam before the test will raise the PSA. So do not perform the test before the PSA. Leave some time between the two. Biopsy. TERP procedure, which is a transurethral resection procedure of the prostate. 
Any manipulation of the prostate gland will raise the PSA in my blood. Recent ejaculation will raise the PSA. Infection or inflammation of the prostate gland will raise the PSA even if it's not cancer. And the benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is very common, also raises the PSA. Anything that disrupts the barrier, be it cancer, infection, etc., will lead to the escape of PSA from the prostate tissue to the blood and we're measuring it in your blood. Causes of low PSA are drugs that interfere with it, such as finasteride, which is 5-alpha reductase, for reasons that we'll discuss soon, and diethylstilbestrol. This is estrogen agonist. This is a female hormone, so to speak. Of course, it makes sense that the female hormone is decreasing the prostate-specific antigen. A sign of manliness. After treatment, after the surgeon has removed my prostate gland or after we destroy the prostate gland by radiation, what do you think should happen to the PSA? It should disappear. It should be between 0 and 0 0.5 nanogram per ml. Way lower than this. If it's decreasing and decreasing and decreasing until it disappears, great successful surgery. But hey, 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 it's coming back again. Oops. And the question is, when did it start to rise again? Oh, medicosis, it took like five years. This is a slow local invasion. Yep, it's probably cancer, locally invasive. But if it came back very quickly, let's say a month after the surgery or two months, this is probably distant metastasis. There are cancer cells outside the prostate. And that's not good. Why is finasteride decreasing the PSA? Because finasteride is 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. When you inhibit this enzyme, my testosterone will never become dihydrotestosterone, which is more potent than testosterone. This dihydrotestosterone is responsible for growing the prostate gland. Of course, finasteride inhibits the enzyme, which inhibits the formation of this, which inhibits the growth of the prostate. So of course it makes sense that the prostate-specific antigen will decrease. So the two drugs that decrease the PSA are finasteride and diethylstilbestrol. The former is anti-male, the latter is pro-female. Remember that the red top tube does not have an anticoagulant. By the way, do you want to learn about the different types and colors of test tubes and why do we use them? And what's the name of the additive that we add inside each tube to the sample? Please watch my video called Flipbotomy Tubes. It's coming soon to my lab's playlist. And if this video gets some like, I'll make another video on prostate acid phosphatase. Is this a useful test? If you want to learn more about cancers, check out my video titled on oncology basics plus my other videos you'll find them in my pathology playlist as well as my cancers playlist more cancers were discussed in my surgery high yields course such as colon cancer and liver cancer as for vulvar cancer vaginal cancer cervical cancer uterine cancer ovarian cancer and breast cancer they were discussed in my obstetrix gynecology high yields at medicosisperfectionaries.com to learn about chemotherapy you can download my anti-cancer pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you do not wish to download these videos but would rather watch them right here on YouTube, then click on the join button and choose the highest tier. You'll get to watch more than 300 premium medicosis videos. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.